So good evening and welcome to our Monday Thursday live stream. Thank you for joining us. Just to say we're not going to begin for about five or ten minutes or so. If you'd like to go and clap to the NHS at eight o'clock, uh, that'd be wonderful if you perhaps did that outside your front door and then maybe came back to join us. If um, you'd like to have some bread and wine ready, uh, that would be really good too. So I hope that's okay. Do come back in a minute. Uh, a picture will come up on, on the screen uh, just for a moment or two uh, while we wait. Uh, but we are live now and just a moment to go and clap the NHS and maybe find some bread and some wine if you'd like to join in a bit later in what we're doing. I'll say this all again in just a moment for those that haven't joined the live stream yet. But if you have joined the live stream, uh, please do go and clap the NHS at eight and find some bread and some wine if you'd like to. But a picture coming up now while we wait for a moment or two. This is 
is our God, the servant's King. He calls us now to follow Him, to bring our lives and the day. Good evening and a very warm welcome to this Monday Thursday live stream. Thank you for joining me. Uh, it's really good to have you uh, with us this evening. Just to say, I said a few moments ago, um, please go and clap the NHS. And I heard many of you clapping, which is wonderful. So thank you for doing that. And I also mentioned about maybe finding some bread and some wine so you can join in a little bit later in what we're going to be doing. So I'm going to give you just a moment to go and perhaps find some bread and wine if you'd like to or something you can use, maybe just bread, if that's all you have available, and uh, you can join in at that point a bit later. So I'll just wait for a moment while perhaps uh, one or two of you go and find uh, what you need. So a warm welcome. Thank you for uh, joining me. I do have Rebecca here helping me, which, which is lovely. And I know her house group is, is watching and others of you too. I can see some replies coming up. So thank you for uh, joining in. This evening is an upper room experience. We normally do this in the church, but of course we can't be in there this year. So I'm hoping that we can still join in uh, in, a, in a similar kind of way as we normally do. And I hope through what we do, you can experience God being with you, Jesus and the Holy Spirit in this Holy Week and as we go towards Easter. Our time together will be, I hope, about 45 or 50 minutes or so. But I hope you can just relax as if you're going to spend the evening uh, with some friends, uh, talking together and maybe eating together. Jesus, of course, spent uh, his time on Monday, Thursday with his friends, his disciples, and it would be good if we can journey back to imagine that we're one of his friends and uh, being with Jesus. It began, didn't it, with a celebration meal together, but the evening changed to be quite different from what they expected uh, and they imagined. So we're going to journey uh, as they did through the, that evening and night. And of course, Jesus spent his last evening with his friends and his disciples. And each part of uh, what we're going to do, uh, there'll be a few words from me, um, uh, part of the Passover story read, a reflection, maybe some actions to do. And I'm hoping there'll be some worship music at various points if that works. And just to say, if the stream does go off at any point, then please do uh, link back in and I'll start the live stream again. But hopefully we'll keep going uh, to the end in our live stream. So please do join with me as if you were in that upper room with Jesus, that Passover meal. Do listen to the readings, um, try and reflect and pray and imagine that you were there. And I do pray that God may bless you in your time um, with me and with each other this evening. So the Passover in Jerusalem, how did Jesus get to that point in his life? Well, he was born a vulnerable baby like uh, we all were. He was a child, a teenager and a young man. He learnt his trade as a carpenter in his father's business. And of course, he had his three years of mission and ministry, which turned Palestine upside down and changed so many people. He had his baptism, uh, his calling of the 12 disciples. There were all those miracles, his teaching, his life, his bringing of a new message not of another human religion, 
uh, religion required about our own merits before God, but the offer of a personal relationship restored and friendship with God. So that's how Jesus arrived at this point uh, in Holy Week on Monday, Thursday. And when he arrived on Palm Sunday and that week, people had expected him to be a certain kind of Messiah, maybe a new religious or military leader. But Jesus turned out to be none of those things. But rather he came to bring a new and different kind of kingdom. He came riding on a donkey, not on a horse, when he arrived in Jerusalem. And what happened next was what no one expected. They thought he'd got it all wrong. And especially when Jesus went to the temple that day, uh, what happened next was far from what they expected. So as we sit, let's hear the first part of this story in the journey of Jesus to Good Friday and Easter Day. So first a reading from Luke chapter 19, verses 45 to 48. Then he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling things there. And he said, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you've made it into a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching in the temple. The chief priests, the scribes and the leaders of the people kept looking for a way to kill him. But they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were spellbound by what they heard. Why did he have to spoil it all? Why did he have to spoil it all? That's what I want to know. It was going so well, way beyond our expectations, until he went and ruined it. All right, so maybe he had to do something. Maybe they were abusing the temple, making a mockery of what it was meant to be. But couldn't he have been more careful, more conciliatory, more diplomatic. A little quiet word in the right ears, surely that was the best way. Perhaps a gesture of disapproval to get the point home. Even a scathing condemnation, condemnation though preferably out of earshot. But this, overturning their tables in a fit of rage, smashing their stalls, driving out their livestock, lashing out in fury, it was asking for it guaranteed to make enemies. And let's face it, hardly good for his image. A troublemaker, they called him after that. And can you blame them? Why couldn't he have left things as they were? They were right behind him, ready to do whatever he asked, dancing for joy in the streets, tearing down branches to greet him. Oh, I know a few might have turned against him, once they realised what he was saying and what he wasn't. There would still have been some determined to do, uh, to do him in. I do realise that. But why did he make it easy for them? Why invite hostility? Why refuse to compromise? I'm trying to understand. I really am. But it's hard. If it had been me, I'd have taken the easy way despite my convictions, toned things down, avoided confrontation, kept in with those who mattered. That's why I'm still alive today, and he's not. Yet deep down, I realise he had no other choice, not if he was going to be true to himself, and he always was. I have to give him that. That's what made him so special. That's why I followed him. That's why I still do, even now. Lord Jesus, we want to be true to our convictions, to stand up for what is right. But it's hard when the pressure is on. It's hard not to bend when all around us disagree. It's hard not to compromise for the sake of peace. It's hard not to tone things down, 
when we find ourselves in the firing line. Yet there are times when we need to stick to our, stick our necks out for what we believe in. Even when doing so may make us unpopular with others. So give us wisdom to know when those times are and give us courage then to hold fast through them all. Amen. So Jesus, he arrived in Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday. The crowds welcomed him, but didn't understand the Messiah God had sent. He taught in the temple over the Monday, the Tuesday and the Wednesday. And then he asked his friends to get everything ready for the Passover meal. A reading from Matthew chapter 26. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. On the first day of unleavened where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the... So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. We were there to celebrate the Passover. We were there to celebrate the Passover, the 12 of us and Jesus together in the upper room. And I don't mind telling you, our hearts were pounding our pulses racing, our imaginations running riot. I mean the Passover. You do know the significance of that, surely. A reminder of God delivering his people, setting them free from captivity, opening the way to a new and different life. Well, what were we to expect? Oh, it's easy now, looking back, to realise we were wrong, but at the time, it seemed to all of us, all except Judas anyway, that this was it, the moment we'd been waiting for, the time when Jesus would pull the rabbit out of the hat, turn the tables on his enemies, show us he was in control after all. But only then, whilst we were eating together, enjoying ourselves more than we had in a long time, he stood quietly, solemnly, and we could see from the look in his eyes, the set of his face, that he had other ideas. He took the bread, lifted it high, then broke it. Enough for all of us. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And before we had time to argue, time even to take it in and what he was saying, he was holding the cup, passing it round. Take this and drink. This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. We were staggered, horrified, and to tell you the truth, more than a little, a little shocked. All right, so he talked of death before, often too often but we never actually believed it we thought he was exaggerating i suppose painting the blackest picture to keep us on our toes but here he was if we'd heard him right offering his own epitaph saying his final farewells preparing us for the end and he was of course in a sense it was the end of a chapter the last page of the book Yet it wasn't over, by no means the end of the story. 
that had only just begun. And we, astonishingly, were part of it, his body here on earth, the sequel to what he had started. Well, we've done as he said, week after week, year after year, breaking bread and sharing wine, reminding ourselves of who he is and who we are, of what he has done and what we have still to do. And we'll go on sharing his supper, gladly, humbly, confidently, until he comes. Lord Jesus, you broke bread and you shared wine with the one you knew who would betray you, with the one you knew who would deny you, with those you knew who would soon abandon you to your fate. But despite everything, you stayed true, freely offering your life. Lord Jesus, you invite us to break bread and share wine, even though we too betray you, we too deny you, we too abandon you time after time. Despite everything, you stay true to us, your body broken, your blood shed for us. Lord Jesus, we praise you and thank you with all our hearts. Amen. In the early evening of that Thursday, Jesus and his friends had a wonderful evening and a Passover meal together. But before they began, Jesus did something that was different from normal, something that gave them a hint of what was to come. From the Gospel of John. Jesus washes his disciples' feet. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realise now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not everyone was clean. When he'd finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one, another, one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. 
Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. We now take a moment to reflect on that reading as we listen to the wonderful worship song from heaven you came, helpless babe, the servant king. So please worship God in your hearts as you listen. song isn't it reminding us of how we need to serve each other as Jesus served his friends 
we can't wash our, our feet uh, at the moment um, or our hands, or we should be washing our hands, we can't wash our feet. Um, but one thing we can do is perhaps share the peace. And uh, whether you're on your own or perhaps with others, I thought it might be nice if we did share God's peace with each other. So I'm going to say, may the peace of the Lord be with you. And uh, perhaps you'd like to say uh, the peace with each other. So may the peace of the Lord be always with you and Thank also you. with you. So let's take a moment to do that. And then I'll go on to the next section in a moment. It's good to share the peace with each other. So as the disciples sat with each other, Jesus washed their feet and I'm sure they shared peace and did other things as well. But not all was right in their hearts or in one person in particular. A reading from Mark chapter 14. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when they'd taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him, one after another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Philip, he couldn't mean me, surely. He couldn't mean me, surely. That's what I kept telling myself. One of the others, perhaps, but not me. I would stay true if no one else did. Dependable to the last. Someone he could stake his life on if he needed to. Yet could he? Deep down, despite my protestations, I wondered. For to tell the truth, I was scared out of my wits. Dreading what the future might hold for us. It was suddenly all too real. The prospect of suffering and death, those warnings Jesus had given, no longer simply words we could push aside, but fact staring us in the face. His enemies were gathering for the kill, greedily waiting their moment, and it was only a matter of time before they came for the rest of us. We'd kept on smiling until then, putting a brave face on things as best we could, if not for his sake, then our own. But suddenly, there could be no more running away. For in that stark sentence, he spelt out the awful truth. One of you will betray me. We protested, of course, vehement in our denials. Yet one by one, we looked away, unable to meet his gaze. It wasn't me, I'm glad to say. But of course, you'll know that by now, won't you? It was Judas who finally couldn't take it. Judas, whose name will go down in history as the one who betrayed Jesus. Yet somehow that doesn't help. For the truth is this. When the moment came, we were all found wanting. All more concerned for our own safety than his. <coughs> Maybe we didn't betray him, but don't think we're feeling smug about it. 
still less like twisting the knife in Judas. For that moment, there in the upper room, made us all take a long, hard look at ourselves. And we didn't much like what we saw. Merciful God, it's not easy being honest with ourselves. For sometimes we prefer to keep things hidden rather than face the disturbing truth. Occasionally, we may glimpse our darker side, but we push it away. Attempting to deny its existence even to ourselves. But the knowledge of our weakness is always there, lurking in the shadows. Help us then to open our hearts before you and acknowledge our faults. In the knowledge that you gave us your son while we were still sinners. To cleanse, redeem, renew and restore. And by your grace to help us. Amen. The Passover meal had many parts to it, but throughout it, it was a time of friendship, conversation, laughter and discussion and of sharing together. And I'm sure that Passover evening with Jesus was a wonderful occasion in many ways. But perhaps just as it was drawing to a close, um, things did change and uh, Jesus did something else that was quite unexpected. As I read the next Bible passage, I'm going to take hold of bread and wine. And if you've got bread and wine with you, um, I hope you can have that uh, near you. And uh, after I've said these words from scripture, we can perhaps share some bread and wine together. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And they had sung a hymn they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's just take a moment to receive the bread and the wine together.
betraying Jesus and denying Jesus. We've all done it in our various ways. Who was responsible for betraying, denying and crucifying Jesus? They all were and we all are too. Jesus knows our hearts and he knew Peter's and the disciples. But Jesus never gives up on us, even when we give up on him. We each need courage to go back to him when we have denied and betrayed him. Jesus is always there loving us and waiting for us to come back. We now have a reading from John's Gospel and Matthew's Gospel. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little while longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples, said the same. We just keep silence for a moment. And after silence for a few moments or two, we'll listen to the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. love for us how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face as wounds which mother chosen one bring many sons to glory Say 
babes, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me is finished I will not boast in anything no gifts no power no wisdom but I will boast in Jesus Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. It's uh, good, isn't it, to hear some worship music after not much music and worship in the last few weeks. So it's uh, lovely to have that music and worship together. The Mount of Olives and Gethsemane. Uh, it was a place away from the city, a place where Jesus and his friends could continue to be together on that Passover evening. But to do God's will, Jesus had to go to a place where he didn't really want to go, uh, losing his own life uh, for others. To find our life, we need to lose our lives too, don't we? To lay down our lives to follow the life of Jesus. Even Jesus struggled uh, with that thought. Uh, but like him, we can find strength when we have faith and trust in God. So let's now hear part of the story about Gethsemane and reflect on its meaning for us. This reading is from Luke chapter 22, and will be followed by a reflection called, He was unsure of himself, uh, reflecting on the words and thoughts of Peter. Luke chapter 22. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. He was unsure of himself for the first time in his life unsure of his ability to face the future. And it hurt him more than the pain he was finally to suffer. You see, 
there had never been any doubt until then. Never even the slightest suggestion of hesitation. Despite the hostility, the resentment, Just a sec. the abuse from so many, he set his face resolutely, resolutely towards Jerusalem. Knowing from the very beginning where it would all end. He understood it all, the pain and the humiliation he must suffer. Conscious of it, even way back, in those heady days of his baptism. Yet he'd carried on willingly. The prospect seemed to hold no fear for him. And we've marvelled at the faith, the love, the courage of the man, the sheer commitment, which gave him such awesome strength and inner purpose. But suddenly, that evening, it was all so very different. A shadow blotting out the light which had shone so brightly. I saw despair in his eyes rather than hope, fear rather than laughter, sorrow rather than joy. And most terrible of all, that desperate look of uncertainty, so alien, so devastating, so crushing a burden. It was all suddenly too real. No longer theory, but fact the agony and the isolation he was about to face. And like any of us would in his place, he wanted to back away, find an easier course, a less dreadful option. It struck me then as never before that he didn't know what lay beyond death any more than I did. He'd always believed, always trusted, but he had no more certainty than you or me. Only the assurance of faith, the conviction born of trust. And there in the darkness, as the chill of the night took hold, it all hung on a thread as he wrestled with the torment of doubt. I know what I'd done, have done if I'd been him. Quite simply, I wouldn't have stopped running until Jerusalem was just a memory. But not Jesus. He stayed quietly in the garden, as I knew he would. And he offered not just his faith, but his doubt to God. Not my will, but yours be done. Well, he was sure of one thing after that. There was no way back. Death, now a cast iron certainty. But it wasn't dying itself that was the problem for him. It was not knowing whether it would be all worth it, whether it could actually make a difference to this world we live in. And there was no way of answering that for certain, this side of eternity. He was unsure of himself, of his faith, of his ability to face the future. But despite it all, he risked everything, offering life itself so that we might know the truth and be free from death, free for all eternity. Loving God, you call us to live by faith, not by sight, to put our faith in things unseen rather than seen. And most of the time we're able to do that. But occasionally we are faced by circumstances which cause us to doubt, throwing a shadow over everything we believe. We question our ability to keep going. We wonder what is happening to us. And though we look to you for assurance, we do not find it. Help us when such moments come to know that you have been there before us in Christ and that you understand what we are facing. Inspire us through the faith and courage he showed. And so help us to trust in your purpose, even when we cannot see the way ahead. In his name we pray. Amen.
a wonderful hymn to draw us towards the end of our time together. So this evening we've been on a journey, uh, something of the journey that Jesus and his disciples took on that Passover evening. And I hope you've experienced something of what they perhaps felt and thought. And I hope we're now ready for the next part of our journey towards Good Friday, when Jesus died to bring forgiveness of our sins that we might have new life, new resurrection life. So can I encourage you to keep going on the journey this Holy Week and towards Easter, to draw close to Jesus and to know him as your friend. To close, I'm going to read in a moment uh, a portion of Isaiah chapter 53. And you might like to just listen and again continue in prayer as I read. After I finish, the live feed will come to an end if you'd like to continue in sort of quiet prayer for a while, that would be lovely. And I'm uh, very pleased to say that Mary Blow at her home is going to be carrying on a prayer vigil until midnight. And if you'd like to join her uh, where you are for some of that time or all of it in prayer, then uh, that would be lovely. Uh, we normally hold this vigil in our church from the end of the Monday Thursday service until midnight. Uh, but of course, we can't do that this year. So if you can at your home, even in a small way, uh, that would be really lovely. So thank you for joining me uh, for this Monday, Thursday live stream service. And if you'd like to join me again, I'll be live again at one o'clock tomorrow as we think about Good Friday, again with some Bible readings and reflections and hopefully a little bit of music in between 
um, and do join me at one o'clock uh, tomorrow on Good Friday. So just as we close, I'm going to read Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. But surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors.